morning. Good morning. I'm Carlicia, Carlicia Wright. I'm the director for the Office of Business Opportunity. And the Office of Business Opportunity, as most of you know, is responsible for, facili for facilitating the city's MWB program, among other things. Um, as such, we're responsible for facilitating certification. We've got approximately 2,600 companies that are certified to do business with the city of Houston. And as you all are mostly, or you guys are all construction companies, um, most of those companies, um, almost half of those companies perform in construction and construction related contracts. And so today we're going to talk specifically about the um, good faith efforts that are required when you're submitting at bid submission as well as post award um, good faith efforts. Um, we've got our team, um, Ms. Marsha Murray, who's the Assistant Director for the Office of Business Opportunity. We have our Division Manager, Morris um, Scott. Morris Scott is the Division Manager for Contract Compliance. You interact with him and his team. He's accompanied by um, several of his Contract Compliance Officers. If you guys can stand up, just wave. These are the individuals, these are some of the individuals that are out in the field on your um, contract, your, your job sites um, after the contract has actually been awarded. You'll also see them at the kickoff, the construction kickoff meetings. But before the contract is even awarded, there are efforts. The goal, there's a goal set on a contract. Um, in our case, it's an MWB goal with SBE participation. Um, you, where you can substitute SBE participation. And we have a team called the Department Services Team. So they support um, internally the city departments in making sure the city understands how to set goals on contracts. We work with the departments to modify goals on contracts as necessary um, to, to reduce them from the citywide um, average. But we also work with, with contractors on good faith efforts um, at bid submission. And so you're submitting, um, when you're submitting your proposal, um, or your bid at the time of award, you're submitting it um, with the good faith efforts or participation plan. And I have um, representing that team, uh, Monica Dennis and Latanya Bolden. You guys stand up for me. So th that's the team. And so you'll be hearing from a variety of folks today. But again, welcome um, to, um, this is our third year um, since the pro program improvements in 2013 that we've facilitated this. But we are available to assist. We um, uh, want to make sure that we're answering your questions, not just today, but throughout the course of the year. If you have questions about good faith efforts, if you have questions and you need clarification on any, um, anything, all of these individuals, including myself, we'd like to offer um, our availability to you to answer those questions and address any concerns so that we can ensure that we've got a successful program. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ms. Marsha Murray, who uh, is the assistant director. She also oversees um, certification for those companies, but she see, oversees contract compliance in the department services team. She will kick off this presentation. And again, today we're going to cover both pre-award and post-award good faith efforts. Thank you. Good morning. So we, we thought, let me just fast forward just a bit. As the director mentioned, we have been holding um, sessions on good faith efforts for the last, this is the third session that we've had in the last three years. And today's session is actually going to be more of a refresher um, session on pre-award um, good faith efforts because last year we actually delved into detail into requirements of the uh, pre-award good faith efforts. We do want to um, address, you know, some ob observations we've made um, this past fiscal year about um, um, challenges some contractors seem to still be having regarding good faith efforts. But the good news really is, since the program improvements in, in, in 2013, we have seen substantial improvements in the good faith effort submissions that have been made. And there are actually fewer and fewer good faith efforts being submitted. In the first year of the new requirement for um, the pre-bid good faith efforts process, um, that you know the new requirement of submitting a participation plan, we saw that there were um, 29 submission of good faith efforts. About 70% of those submissions were actually valid good faith efforts. And um, this past year, we only saw f 14 uh, submission of good faith efforts, and 80% of those were actually 
you know, valid good faith efforts that were approved only. We only had three denials. And so that's really indicating that um, a majority of the plans that are being submitted by the contracting community, by, by you all, are actually compliant participation plans. You know, and when you do need to actually um, set forth your good faith efforts, they are actually compliant. So we just really, we want to, you know, it would be great to reach perfection. So we'd like to um, just go through some, um, emphasize some of the areas that we think that we could maybe provide a bit more guidance in, and kind of show you how we assess your plans and what are some of the common um, challenges that we may see in some of the plans that are turn out to be uh, denied. Um, so I will just briefly go over again. I'm not going to go into detail the, uh, the specifics of the pre-award good faith efforts policy. I'll go over generally um, good faith efforts. And I'll also um, um, introduce a companion guide that we've actually created about documentation to pr that you should provide with your good faith efforts to support your efforts. Um, that actually com uh, companion guide is born out of some feedback that we got from you um, over the last year and definitely during the session last year about specific documentation, a little bit more guidance on specific documentation that we're looking for. So it's a little one pager that should, should help you and that's going to actually be available on our website and you have a copy in front of you today. Um, and then the team will, will talk to you about enhancements that we've made to the uh, 470, 471, and 472 forms. And again, those enhancements are really made to make sure that um, the information that we're requesting from you is clear. Um, and that you can complete those forms with ease. And some of the, and I don't want to get ahead and I don't want to steal some of what my staff members are actually going to share, but it's really some of the changes that we made really came directly from the feedback that you have actually provided us with. And uh, we'll talk a bit more about how we assess your participation plans, um, how we actually, and also look at some case studies of um, submissions that were made that were approved. We'll look at one approved uh, case study and one denied uh, good faith efforts. And uh, we'll, I'll talk a little bit about the appeals process. Um, I think every single denial that we had in fiscal year 15 has actually been appealed. And so there has been a modification in our appeals process and I'll talk a little bit about that. And finally, um, I think this is, well, this is the first time since I've been here for the last three and a half years that we've had a, uh, a large session discussing um, post-award good faith efforts and the policy, the elements of the policy that, that applies to the efforts you make during the course of the contract to meet the goal. Um, I know that Morris and his team at pre-bid conferences, pre-proposal conferences talk about the requirements of good faith efforts in meeting the goal, but we're going to delve into that a little bit more uh, today and, and we're also going to kind of um, zoom in on commercial useful function and what that means in you actually meeting um, the contract goals. So let's get started. Okay. It's, you know, um, I think it's important to just emphasize that this program, the Minority Women Small Business Enterprise Program, is actually a program that is um, supported by an ordinance. So we don't just come up with the rules and policies surrounding the program. The City of Houston Code of Ordinance actually lays out how this program is supposed to actually function. And of course, the purpose of this program is to promote the growth and success of women, um, minority women in small business enterprises. And one of the ways that we do that is through goal-oriented contracts. Um, and as you uh, may recall, back in 2012, we had a disparity study published that laid out that, in fact, there continued to be disparities in the local marketplace and the participation of these types of companies. So that's why the city continues to support and emphasize the need to make sure that we, we recognize when there are opportunities on city contracts for subcontracting to uh, minority women in small business enterprises. And um, again, it's, I, we're going to emphasize it a number of times throughout the presentation today. The goals are not quotas. You know, you, the, the standard for determining whether or not you've met the goal is your good faith efforts. So um, um, I, it's just really important to em emphasize that. Your good faith efforts, so if you don't hit the goal, you at least need to establish. You need to establish the efforts that you've made to, to try to actually meet the goal. And there's actually a formula that's involved in coming up with contract goals. We don't um, just pull goals out of the air. We use an industry-wide um, standard, which is, is there um, actually divisible work on a contract? What is that divisible work? And do we have certified firms who are actually available to do that divisible work? 
So if those factors are met, then we'll place a goal. We do factor in you know, historical participation in order to fine tune the goal, because we don't want to put goals on contracts that you're not going to be able to meet. You know, it makes no sense to do that. We do not want to set you up for failure. So we do consistently um, apply this formula to coming up with goals on contracts. So good faith efforts as laid out in the policy are steps taken to achieve the contract goal, which by their scope, their intensity, and their usefulness demonstrate your responsiveness to fulfill the business opportunity goals, objectives of the city, as well as the, in the post-award phase, the contractor's responsibility to put forth measures to meet or exceed contract goal throughout the duration of the contract. Simply put, good faith efforts is basically evidence of your genuine attempt to meet the contract goal. So as you, as you should be familiar with if you've been doing work with the city for some time is the good faith efforts policy um, is a part of document 808, which is a part of the solicitation document. So it's appendix, it's an appendix to document 808. I just included an image here of that document, but if you've been doing work with the city, you're familiar with it. If you're new to the city um, and want to do work with the city, that's where the good faith efforts policy, it's also on our website, of course, if you happen to lose a hard copy of it. So let's talk about pre-award good faith efforts. So this is the, the efforts that you're making um, before you submit your bid. So the policy outlines, and again, I won't go through in detail, but I just want to highlight the elements of the pre-award uh, portion of the good faith efforts policy. So the, the policy outlines that attendance at pre-bid meetings is important. That's a part of your good faith efforts. And attendance at pre-bid meetings served you know, a couple of different purposes. If you happen to disagree with what the goal is, you think it's too high, um, I suppose you could think it's too low as well, um, but if you disagree with what the goal is, that's a form in which to actually state that there are issues with the goal and what those issues are with the goal. Do not wait until you submit a good faith efforts plan to us to do that because we're going to, the team is going to be looking for evidence of you actually notifying the contract and the department that there's a problem and making some efforts. That will bolster your, um, your submission of good faith efforts if we can see that there's actually a, um, a history in that procurement of you actually stating that the goal might be off. It's also, attend the pre-bid um, meeting is also an opportunity to meet other, to meet certified firms that you may want to actually subcontract to. So we do, you know, one of the first things that's listed in the, in the policy is attending, attending the pre-bid pre meeting. Outreach and advertisement. You know, certainly in your efforts to find um, certified firms to, um, to work on your contracts, you know, reach out to organizations that actually support minority and women, women-focused organizations, see if they can actually assist you with your outreach efforts. And also another element that's listed in the good faith efforts policy is advertising in, in news media outlets that are focused on minority and women um, organizations. Now, you don't have to do every single step that I'm actually, um, I'm just going through the policy here, but these are options that you have to establish that you've done good faith efforts. Um, access and point of contact. Provide, another way in which we look at the efforts, we give you credit for your good faith efforts is, did you actually provide access to certified firms to uh, the plan for that particular project? Did you designate someone as a point of contact that they could actually reach out to to ask questions? You know, were you open about what the opportunities actually were on that particular project? Um, enter into, um, provide written notice to certified firms about uh, what opportunities there are on that project. Solicit them through written, uh, through a written solicitation, pardon me, and provide them with information about the project. And that, that one page, a companion guide that I actually mentioned earlier, actually outlines you know, what we're looking for on that documentation that you've provided to us to show that you've done, the, um, you've done this outreach in and, and provided notice um, and solicited um, firms in a timely manner. Enter into another element is enter into contracts 
with providers with, with, um, with contracts that you've actually entered into with certified firms um, to actually uh, do the work, as well as notices of intent. And negotiating good faith, the policy outlines, you know, what that actually means. And the, the one-pager document that we've created also emphasizes what that, what that actually looks like. You know, what is negotiated in good, in, in good faith with, um, with certified firms. And I'll talk about, talk about that a little bit more um, in a couple of slides. And designate work that will result, result in participation by certified firms. Again, we use a formula for, arrive at, for arriving at a goal. So clearly the city has identified, if there's a goal in a contract, that there are opportunities there. Now we're not going to tell you opportunities there for subcontracting. We're not going to tell you specifically what it is that you should subcontract out. That's up to you which portion of the work that you, sh you want to subcontract out. But there are opportunities there and designate. So to come back to us and say, no, there are absolutely no opportunities. You would really need to make a really compelling argument and we need to have really missed some major things in our assessment of the goal in order for you to successfully actually make an argument that there really isn't any work to subcontract out. So designate portions of work in which it's likely that certified firms will be able to participate. And the explanation piece also goes back to negotiating in good faith. You know, if you can provide to us, you know, um, um, documentation that you've actually provided explanation to firms um, who are, whose bids were rejected and, and why. And again, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. And the last piece that's, that's listed here, highlighted here, is new efforts. So yes, good faith efforts are assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. But we are actually going to be looking at your history of, um, of you as a contractor, your individual history of, of compliance. You know, and have you actually been submitting, making those exact same efforts time and time again without actually um, your efforts resulting in meeting the goal or you know, being able to put forth this, uh, a, part, a good participation plan? If you're doing the same thing over and over again and you're not getting the des desired result, that is actually going to be something that we're not going to view as good faith efforts. Um, so I, th I'm just highlighting a few things from the policy. Of course, this is not an exclusive, nor is it an exhaustive list. There are other things that you can certainly do to show your good faith efforts, but these are some of the common elements um, that's involved in assessing good faith efforts. We've gone through this before, and I failed to actually mention to you the more detailed presentation that we've had on good faith efforts last year, for particularly pre-big good faith efforts, is on our website. Um, so you can certainly um, look at that at any point. The video from last year, if you'd like to sit through that video again, is also on our website, but it is available for you to kind of um, delve into more detail about the good faith efforts policy. But just as a reminder, establish relationships with MWSBEs in advance. You know, so that when the projects actually come up that you have a list of companies that you can actually use. And that ties in actually with the last bullet on the list is review the capital improvement project um, in advance, plan rather, in advance and discuss projects and opportunities with MWSBEs. Just prepare yourself for these opportunities so you're not scrambling at the last minute. I, ideally, that, that, that's the course to take. Like I mentioned earlier, subdivide the work. You know, make sure that they're manageable portions that you actually can subcontract out. Utilize our City of Houston directory to find your certified firms. Like the director mentioned, we actually we increase our pool of certified firms every day. So we're up to um, we're up to 2,600 um, firms that are certified. When I first started three and a half years ago, it was about 1,500. You know, so there's definitely been a significant um, increase in the number of firms that are actually available out there. And if you're having problems actually finding a certified firm to do the work, reach out to us. You know, we're here to, to provide assistance to you um, as needed. Um, like I mentioned before, directly solicit to the MWSBs. Make sure that's in a timely manner. The policy actually says that needs to happen um, no, in no less than seven business days before the um, bid due date. And we are, my team, before they submit anything to me for review and approval, they're making sure that that's, that's, the, that's the case. Um, and those efforts will not be valid if they're not timely. Um, provide relevant bidding contract information, like I mentioned earlier, to the certified firms about the project. Um, advertise the opportunities. 
offer assistance to MWSBEs. The as needed, the policy actually outlines, um, you know, if there's, a, there's bonding assistance, if that's the case in the project, certainly um, you can show that you've offered assistance in that way, in that category. Or there are other areas in which, you know, maybe a certified firm may need assistance. If you illustrate to us that you've actually made that offer, that's something that we would actually factor in. Um, build a relationship, next bullet you know, make sure that you're building relationships. Go back to subcontractors that you've used in the past. If they've done good work for you, I mean, there's no actually limitation for you to, um, that you can't reuse contractors that you have, subcontractors that you've used in the past. Um, if no one responds, and I, and I try to emphasize this in the one pager, if no one responds to your email blast, and I think we've discussed in the last two sessions why email blast alone is just not sufficient pick up the phone and call. The policy actually requires that you follow up on your initial solicitations. So we're going to actually be looking, looking for that. But again, we have seen improvements in the plan. So we're seeing, you know, we're seeing you do, do these things, but we just want to, for those who haven't, you know, completely gotten it yet, we just want to emphasize. So the companion guide um, to the policy, the one pager that you have, so what we did here was, um, so the policy the, at times lists specific documents that we'd be looking for, but there were some areas in which we just, you know, talked about the effort that we would be looking at, but we didn't necessarily lay out what kind of documentation, uh, which is typical not to do in a policy, um, to lay out what kind of documentation we're looking at, but we thought to really further assist you, we wanted to just be able to, to give you a, um, a list and a guide of what we're actually looking for when we're assessing good faith efforts. So the, the one pager actually focuses on three major areas, um, direct solicitation of certified firms, outreach efforts and advertisement, and whether you negotiate in good faith. If you lose the copy that you have today, you can certainly go on our website. Um, to, um, to take a look at this document. Um, we just quickly, on this one pager, um, we, I talk about pre-bid attendance, the importance of that. We're actually going to be asking the department. In each and every case, we ask the department, did this contractor attend the pre-bid conference? And so we actually get the sign-in sheet. And so that's part of our evaluative process. Um, the written solicitation, we're looking to make sure that you have included the relevant factors about the work um, in the written solicitation that you actually send out to contractors, a description of the specific work, the contact, a contact name for to ask questions. Um, we're looking um, for copies of your emails. I mean, sometimes you actually do provide, you know, a spreadsheet, you know, spreadsheets you know, with the outreach that you've done. We're also looking for follow-up to that initial out outreach as well. Um, in the outreach and advertisement, we're looking for documentation um, of the name of the organization that you did outreach to the person you contacted, their phone number, um, and the result of that contact. Advertisement, a copy of that advertisement, the date in which the advertisement was done. And negotiating in good faith um, whether um, whether you negotiate good faith with uh, certified firms that were interested and you didn't just um, reject um, the certified firms as unqualified um, without sound reasons based on thorough investigation and, the, and their capabilities. So, so provide us with a detailed reason why you rejected. We're not asking you necessarily for the, the price. I know, I know, we, had a, you know we had a discussion a couple of years ago about you know, dis discomfort and actually revealing that kind of information, but provide us with a, an explanation as to why um, a firm, each firm were, was actually rejected. Um, if that's the crux of your, your good faith efforts that you didn't actually get you know, a competitive price, and if price was not the reason, what was the reason for the rejection of the bid? This uh, image of the of that companion guide. So at this point, I'm going to um, ask uh, Latanya Bolden to uh, to come up and um, kick off our presentation and talk about the enhancements, um, the portion of the presentation regarding enhancements that we've made to the various um, forms. Latanya will cover the form 470, which is the participation plan. She'll also just do a refresher on how we actually calculate the goal how we assess whether or not um, on the participation plan, if you do not submit a 471 or 472, which, is, which are the good faith efforts documents, how are we actually assessing your um, goal compliance on, on those forms? 
<laughs> First of all, I want to say thank you to my assistant director for leading us into this um, discussion. Uh, that was a lot of excellent information um, to assist you with your uh, filling out your forms. So now what we're going to talk about is we're going to discuss the document 470, which is your uh, bidder's MWSBE participation plan. A bidder's MWSBE participation plan is one submitted at the time of the bid. Okay? And what this form does is it captures the MWSBE participation that the bidder commits to achieve for that particular contract. It's also used for determining whether a bidder has a plan to meet the goal. The first enhancement that has been done to the form was language was added to include a good faith efforts requirement to provide supporting documentation, which you'll find on page one. The second enhancement was language added to specify the city's separate contract goals and how to count MWSBE participation in order to meet the city's MWBE contract goal. If you look at the embrace box, red box, MBE and WBE goals are two separate contract goals. Any excess of one goal cannot be applied to meet another goal. And an SBE can be applied to the MBE and or WBE goals, but not to exceed 4%. This is very important because we're going to have a little quiz later. Okay, enhancement three. Here we have an example added to specify how the MWB participation percentage should be presented on the form. You'll find this on page one and page two. Enhancement four, uh, we've, we've added some selection boxes and language um, which was added to certification type of goal. One thing to remember, please, one MWSBE firm cannot be used to meet multiple goals. And if you take a look at the Embrace box, here you can now check MBE, WBE, or SBE. Enhancement five is a table that was added to list bidders participation plan total for MBE, WBE, and SBE. And that's been placed at the bottom. So now let's discuss assessing your uh, MWSBE participation plan. Now this is what you're going to do when you're trying to assess your, your plan. In other words, you're preparing your uh, information to turn in. Achievement of the goal. MBE and WBE goals are separate subcontracting goals to be met how? Individually. Any excess of the MBE or WBE goal cannot be used to meet a deficient MBE or WBE goal. Only 4% SBE can be used to meet either the MBE and or WBE goal, but both cannot get 4% each. Supplies can contribute up to 50% of the contract goal. Supplies alone do not stimulate growth among MWSBEs. Therefore, a limit is required to achieve the program's goal. So what do we have? We have MBE goal plus WBE goal equals the contract goal. Only City of Houston certified firms may be used to meet either the MBE goal or WBE goal. You can visit the OBO website at www.houstontx.gov slash OBO slash and click the link Certified Firm Directory to search for Houston Certified Vendors. Calculating participation. Now we're going to have a test. I want to make sure that you really heard everything that I, that I just went over because it's very important and will assist you in, in your filling out your forms. Okay, the contract goal has 13% MBE and 8% WBE. The bidder's participation numbers that were submitted, SBE 6%, MBE 9%, and WBE 8%. Does this plan meet the goal? Can't hear you. 
Yes. All right. Yes, this plan meets the goal. Why? These are separate goals to be met how? Individually. Goals are to be met individually. 4% of SBE may be used to meet the MBE and or WBE goal. MBE 9% plus 4% from SBE is equal to what? 13%. WBE 8% plus 13% is equal to 21%. So yes, this does meet the goal. Example two, contract goal 11% MBE and 8% WBE. The bidders submitted participation numbers, SBE 12%, MBE 6%, WBE 4%, making a total of 22%. Does this plan meet the goal? No. Correct, no it does not. Why? These are separate goals to be met how? Individually. That's right, correct. Only 4% of SBE may be used to meet either the MBE and or WBE goal, not 4% for each. Okay, WBE 4% plus 4% from SBE equals to 8%. The remainder SBE percentage cannot be used for MBE goal calculation. Only the WBE goal is met. Example three. The contract goal is 15% MBE and 5% WBE. The bidders submitted participation numbers, SBE 5%, MBE 13%, with 11% from suppliers and 2% for service. WBE 10%. Total bidder plan submitted, 28%. Does this plan meet the goal? Okay, let's see. Okay, let's just get to the bottom of this answer. <laughs> yes, it does. It meets the goal. Why? After assessment, 12% plus 3% equals 15% MBE plus 5% WBE gives us a total of 20%. Only up to 50% of the total goal may be calculated from suppliers. Here, only 10% of suppliers and the 2% of service will be calculated into the MBE goal for a total of 12% MBE participation. Up to 4% of SBE participation may be calculated into MBE and WBE participation. In this case, MBE may be increased to 16% after taking 3% of the allowed 4% SBE. Now I'm going a little easy on you guys because I can break this down pretty quick because I assess these and so can uh, my colleague Monica. But this is some very important information so you can kind of keep it when you're doing your forms. Now here's what you need to remember. Remember, bidders completely fill out the form 470 when? Prior to bid submission. Okay? Bidders must submit the 470 with the bid or else the bid is non-responsive. Bidders must fill in each box, how? Completely. Completely. They must what? Sign the document. Please, all information must be provided in order to be deemed responsive. Okay, so that's it. We're going straight into Monica, my colleague. Thank you, LaTanya. At this portion of the presentation, I'm going to go over the good faith efforts, and this is the meat of the, uh, of the presentation that you are most interested in. As we've discussed previously, we've already talked about the program rules, the city's stance and policy. We've talked about what the good faith efforts policy looks like the 470 form which provides your MWSB participation plan to us and how to count participation which is all important in determining whether or not you need to supply and make a good faith efforts request to us when you're submitting your goal, uh, submitting your bid to the city rather. 
So d do you think that we're all on the same page now as far as when we are going to be providing good faith efforts documentation to the city? Okay, good. So we're doing this at bid submission. So if you find that during your bidding that you can't meet the goal and you fall short of meeting the advertised contract goal, you must submit your good faith efforts on two documents. That's document 471 and 472. Document 471 will go into detail shortly. Document 472 will be followed after that in detail. And again, supporting documentation, which we've covered already, it's um, very crucial in making or breaking a good faith efforts request. Think of it as, um, you know, when I was in school, we had math and we had to do long division, and the teacher always said, show your work, show your work. Don't just put the answer down just because you know it. Well, this is, I think, the only time this rule falls into place. <laughs> so again, show your work. So document 471, if you want to follow me, you can look at the forms and we'll go into the slight enhancements that we've done. Um, the document 471 captures the efforts taken by you as the bidder in order to meet the advertised contract goal. The form is designed to capture information that you may have done in order to meet the goal. So those consist of um, providing the scope of work and the work elements that you were trying to subdivide and subcontract, the certified firms in those elements, in those areas and work areas that you were trying to subcontract to, whether they were what their certification type was, whether they were woman-owned businesses, minority-owned businesses, um, how much of SBEs did you try to use as well, and their, the method of contact you used to outreach to certified firms. Was it just one method? Did you fax, email, did you call? What were those dates? Um, and what were the responses that you received in trying to reach those certified firms? And in the case that they were not used, what were those reasons? So the form is designed to capture this information and as a way to, to see what kind of efforts you made in trying to meet the goal. Again, just to emphasize, this is submitted at bid submission, which was different than a couple of years ago. So there were slight modifications done to this form. Document 471, um, if we look at the first paragraph, we had emphasized that the need for supporting documentation is necessary. So just it's serving as a reminder that not only when you are providing this information to us, to, to provide some support. So again, the, the guide that we have to use for supporting documentation would be very useful to get familiar with. That way you get consistent with what kind of information we're looking for as supporting documentation. The next enhancement, we simply underlined something to point out to you that if, if you do not meet the contract goal, a failure to not provide 471 may result in being non-responsive. So this is just, again, serving as a reminder to be aware of the importance of this form. And one last thing, like we did in the 470, we have this checkbox for you just for simplifying some of the important information that we need um, in, in order to just kind of guide everyone better and, and for simplicity. Now, many contractors like to use their own forms and their own uh, spreadsheet as supporting documentation. Now, that's, very, that's fine, you can do that. Remember to turn in the form, complete it, and you may submit the information on the spreadsheet with the relevant information that you have there that's also acceptable too. So that's just uh, something that you, you may do as well. So now we'll discuss 472. Again, this is going to accompany your 471 and your 470. This is again at bid submission. And this is different than the, in the, four, than the 471 in that this captures efforts taken beyond what's described in the 471. So if there's anything else that was not captured in that uh, form that you had done to try to meet the goal, then that's something that you can provide an information to us here on this form. There's also 
um, an opportunity for you to state any kind of justification as to why you cannot meet the goal. So this is what this form captures and what it illustrates and how it's different from the 471. Slide enhancements again were made to this form. As a reminder, we, we saw that many contractors that are bidding overutilize the SBE in trying to meet the goal. They over relied on it. And so we just pointed out as a reminder as you're putting these forms together, just remember only 4% is allowed, a maximum of 4% is allowed. So we place that on there for you as a reminder. Again, to uh, follow the rest of the forms that we've done, we've also provided an enhancement just stating again the importance of providing supporting documentation. And the last enhancement, we just changed some of the wording. Pr previously, we had bidder and buy, and we specified we want the company representative and the, um, the company name as well that's that we can contact in the event we need to. So this is some important information. And we found that bidders have gotten a lot better at this. So you either meet the contract goal, and if you do, this will be provided in, you just need to provide one form, that's document 470. If you cannot meet the goal and you fall short, you'd be providing 470, 471, 472, all at bid submission, and your supporting documentation. Keep in mind, if you haven't experienced this already, we cannot accept any kind of supporting documentation after you submit your bid. So it's important to provide that at bid submission. And you will only be contacted by the Office of Business Opportunity in the event that we have some clarification that we need from you. And this is done on a case-by-case -case basis. And um, we'll be in contact in the event that there's something not unclear to us. So now that we have covered many aspects of this presentation, we're going to put it into um, use in the form of a case study. The case study is going to illustrate what exactly a bidder did when they provided an approved good faith effort and what a bidder did when they provided a good faith effort request that was denied. So this could give you some perspective what to look at and, and the quality of one versus another. So good faith efforts generally consist of completed documents, evidence of their good faith efforts with supporting documentation. So here's our first case study. So it's a little convoluted, but again, we're going to go over this. Um, it, it's good to go it, into it a bit in detail just so we can walk through this together and see what a good, approved good faith effort looks like. So in, in this case, we have a plant work project with a 13% MBE goal and a 7% WBE goal. The bidder provided a participation plan of 13.82% MBE 0% for the WBE, and 0.91% for the SBE. Now, when we assess the plan, and when the bidder assessed the plan, they actually found that they did not, in fact, meet the goal. The 13, the overage, the 0.82% overage of the MW, MBE goal does not apply towards any deficit goal. So you can't apply it to the MBE goal. It doesn't count towards any total goal. So when you assess the plan, they only met the 13% MBE goal. Now, because of the allowed 4% SBE, you can substitute a deficit goal. So in this case, the bidder could substitute the 0.91% SBE, giving the WBE goal 0.91%. Despite the substitution, the WBE goal was still short, and, which resulted in the, M, the WBE goal rather not met by 6.9%. 6.09%. So the bidder was aware that they were not able to meet the goal, and they provided the, the information that we needed, a good faith efforts request, and they provided document 470, 471, and 472. They also provided an attachment. So you can make this case on the 472, but they provided a, um, a document to, demo, to, to state why they couldn't meet the goal as well. So it was just an extension of 472. Um, they also provided documentation that supported the MWB SBEs contacted, the certification type that, in which they were going to use to meet the goal, uh, the, the work capabilities of the certified firms, 
the scope of work that they were intended to use the certified firms for. They provided, the documentation they provided stated the dates of contact for the faxes that they sent out, the emails that they sent out, and also the telephone calls that they provided um, for follow-up. So they went beyond the initial solicitation. Uh, the results of contact that they made with the certified firms was also listed. The fax log and email log submissions, the proof of that was also provided. And a sample bid invitation that they sent to the certified firms, which provided the, the project information, the bid date, link to the plans, who the person is as their contact, point of contact in the event that there are questions by the certified firms that they were able to de demonstrate that simply by providing their bid invitation that they submitted. And also there was um, advertisement in um, news media and organizations that they did to, to certified um, um, minority owned and women owned um, organizations. So that was also done and they provided proof of those advertising. So after the Department Services Unit of the Office of Business Opportunity evaluated and verified the details. We found that indeed this bidder made a good faith effort. So despite their outreach, despite the many forms that they solicited, the WBE specifically, they made a good faith effort to meet the goal. So because of that, we were able to follow the good faith efforts policy and this bidder was able to demonstrate many elements of the good faith efforts policy that allowed them to receive an approved good faith effort. So, you know, this, this is following, so they not only subdivided the work, they provided um, a point of contact to the certified firms to, to make available in the event that there are questions, access to the plans links, they gave them all the project information they notified a reasonable number of firms as well. They followed up with certified firms. They solicited firms in a timely manner, which is very important. If you're reaching out to firms 10 days in advance versus two days in advance, there's a big difference when you're notifying certified firms and soliciting them for bids. Um, the policy states seven, no less than seven business days. Um, and they, they negotiated in good faith efforts. So in, ca in, in, in case you're wondering what that looks like, they, the bidder provided a MWSBE plan of 13.91%. So there was effort. Their efforts yielded in some sort of participation. So, and once we requested the city's pre-bid meeting, we found in fact that they did attend the meeting. So all these efforts and elements that we have described here shows what an approved good faith effort looks like. So now we're going to move on to what a denied good faith effort looks like. We've actually seen um, examples of this in some good faith efforts requests. And this alone is not going to serve as a reason to why you can't meet the goal. Not enough divisibility on the job. The contractor is choosing to self-perform the work. There's not enough low MWBE bids. The nature of the work is specialty or I ran out of time and I couldn't fill out the information. We have seen that before. So uh, one thing that we've talked about already is in the event that there are some challenges in meeting the goal for a particular project, it is important to raise this information while you're bidding the project and before the bid job bids. The city has processes in place in order to change a goal in the event that there's something wrong. So we encourage you to talk about this prior to your bid submission. The pre-bid meeting is a perfect place to do it. You've got um, clarifications that you can ask, requests for information, lots of things that you can do as your um, outlet to, to make sure the goal is where it is and if there's something that we need to look at, it has to be done prior. Doing the, making the case at good faith efforts is not the time, as we've already stated. So let's get into the second case study. We have a large water line project and there was an advertised contract goal of 12% MBE, 7% WBE. The bidder provided a participation plan of 2.34% MBE, 0.08 WBE and 1.07% SBE. When, we, when the bidder assessed the plan and when we confirmed that the bidder's 
the bidder applied the, the 1.0% SBE to the MBE, we found that it was 3.41% and the WBE remained unchanged at 0.08%. So both the MBE goal and the WBE goal were both unmet. The bidder did provide the, form, the information on the forms. It was the 470, 471, and 472. The bidder provided the only information that we were able to get from that good faith efforts was that they contacted certified firms. It provided the certified firms that, they were, contact, that were contacted and the contact details, so the address, name, and phone number their certification type, whether they were an MBE, SBE, or WBE, and their work capabilities, so what were they certified in. When department services evaluated and the documentation and investigated the details, we found that there were elements that the bidder was able to meet. They did subcontract the work. They did show that there was, um, that they tried to subcontract it out in different um, scopes in order to meet the goal. They did have some participation on the plan, so they negotiated in good faith with a 3.49% participation plan. They stated that they solicited in the news media and um, to organizations focused towards minority and women. And they did send this information to a, a big pool of certified firms. So we were able, that directly reflects the good faith efforts policy. But despite that, the good faith effort was not established. Again, the importance, we didn't know how the certified firms were contacted or if they were contacted. We didn't know when they were contacted. We didn't know um, what the results of contact were. We didn't know the same information for the organizations and associations that were submitted. So again, those are very key factors in determining a good faith efforts. And there was no documentation to support that as well. So when we rendered a decision, we found that this, in fact, was a denial because we were not able to establish any of the elements in the good faith efforts policy. Again, media and organizations were not notified in a timely manner. We were not able to, to substantiate that how they were contacted, whether or not they were notified in a timely manner again, and um, the bidder also did not provide, uh, attend the pre-bid meeting as well. So when we requested that documentation, they were unable, they did not show up. We hope that this was able to illustrate uh, this information to you, and now I'm gonna pass this on to the assistant director, um, Marsha Murray, to go over the appeals process. Okay, so appealing a good faith efforts denial. So once the team, the department services team, um, and I'll talk about pre-award and post-award um, denials, um, once the team has done their investigation and they've compiled all the information and made their recommendation, I then, I then actually review everything that's submitted. Um, and of course, they'll reach out to you uh, with questions that I may have if I need uh, additional information in order to make a final determination. So once um, a final determination is made, if that determination is made to uh, deny your pre-award good faith efforts, then you, we will, and it's important that we have your email information, we will notify you via email, you receive a letter um, from us, uh, signed by me, um, letting you know um, your, that your good faith efforts was denied and that you can submit a written request um, to appeal this denial within three business days of the date of that letter to the director. Um, that is the next um, layer of, of review. Um, so in last year, uh, prior to the change in our appeals pro policy, I reviewed again and then it went to the director. It was a bit of a more protracted process, but it's going directly to the director for appeal. Um, and I believe the appeals that we've had so far uh, for under this process, um, I think most of the appeals have been done via telephone. Um, so certainly you have that option. That's actually been something that's been utilized, I think, by everyone who appealed this fiscal year. It could also be done in person. Um, but certainly for expediency, um, it might be, you know, just better to, to request an over-the-phone um, appeal. If the director denies, upholds the denial of the good faith efforts, 
then the next um, step for appeal is actually the legal department. So the legal department contract section is actually the final layer of review in this appeals process. So we are going, our office, um, the Office of Business Opportunity will facilitate that appeal with the legal department. So again, you'll reach out um, to, the, um, to the director's office via the email that's, that's um, here um, to request an, a second layer of review by the legal department. It will facilitate that, that, that review. And so again, um, the decision by the legal department is the final determination by the city of Houston regarding your pre-bid um, good faith efforts request. Um, and um, you'll be provided with a written determination in each instance when the director, when you, we have that first layer of review by the director, she'll provide you with a letter um, um, summarizing the reason why the denial is upheld or, you know, she'll, she'll reverse it. Um, the, le the legal department, excuse me, will, will do the same as well. I just want to emphasize that failure to submit um, Forms 470, 471, and 472 results in a waiver of your right to appeal. There's nothing to appeal then. So if you fail to submit those forms, you, you, you don't have a right to actually challenge to challenge and determination. Now in the, and Morris will actually talk about this when he goes through the, the post-award good faith efforts process, but um, you, there is a challenge, um, there is a process in place for challenging a final rating on a contract um, as, as well once you receive a letter with my signature and Morris's signature about that determination, but he'll walk, he'll walk you through that. And so I invite Morris to come forward and talk about post-award good faith efforts. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes. All right, I'm Morris Scott, I'm with the Office of Business Opportunity, I'm the Contract Compliance Manager, and I think I have uh, we introduced my team earlier. I think we have one other person from my team that showed up. Ashley, wave your hand. Ashley Thompson. Okay. So I'm going to talk to you about post good faith efforts. Post good faith efforts. So why do we have good faith efforts? Good faith efforts are really designed so that if you are unable to meet the goal, here is your opportunity to present something to the city to say, please evaluate my efforts. Uh, to see if my efforts are sufficient in order to meet, to get a satisfactory rating on the, on the contract. So if you, look at our, our, uh, if you look at our script here, at our slides here, it talks about if you fail to achieve the good faith effort, if you fail to achieve the goal on a project, you can submit your good faith efforts in lieu of that. What happens when you submit your good faith efforts? We actually, we meaning the contract compliance officers that are managing your contract, actually evaluate those efforts, and then we make a recommendation to the, to the assistant director on whether or not we feel your efforts were sufficient to get a satisfactory rating, uh, even though you did not meet the, the goal that was placed on the contract. Uh, just like up front, just like uh, what, they, what Monica and Tanya, LaTanya talked about up front about good faith efforts in that you're documenting your efforts to, to meet the goal, things you have to do in order to, to prove to us that you were sincerely interested in trying to meet the goal, our process is the same. Uh, the good faith efforts pos policy for construction contracts is outlined in document 808, which is included in all your construction contracts. And we also have our policy online, so you can always go online and read it. And then I just want to remind you, because we, we hear this all the time, we took your certified firms and we use your certified firms and now you're not giving us credit for using your certified firms. Just because the firm is certified does not necessarily mean that you're gonna get credit because if they are working outside of an area that they are certified to work in, we're not going to be allowing credit for those dollars towards the goal, okay? And I see some eyes rolling, but we will be glad to answer questions at the end of the presentation. So we'll keep moving. Okay. Uh, good faith efforts. Oh, I'm sorry. I also, I also have another compliance officer here with me, Donald Black. He's over in the back. I didn't see him, but he's, wave your hand, Donald. He's another person on our team that actually helps us in the evaluation of for efforts. So we talked a lot about what we talked a lot about your good faith efforts post-award. Here's what we're, we're, we're only dealing with now 
what happens when the contract ends. So Monica and LaTanya talked a lot about what happens before you're awarded the contract. We're specifically dealing with after the contract has been awarded to your company and now we want to, now all the work has been completed and now we want to see if your efforts are deemed sufficient so that we can award you a satisfactory rating even though you didn't get the MWBE goal that we were looking for. So, and, and an example would be if we're asking for an 18% MWBE goal and you come in at the end of the contract when, after we've paid all the uh, money to, to the prime, you come in at 15%, you know, A plus B means if, if it was an 18% goal and you did 15% without good faith efforts, you didn't make it, you failed. But with good faith efforts, it allows you to meet that, it allows you to take your 15% that you obtained on the contract and it allows you to submit that 15% along with all of your efforts and documentation of what you did to try to, to find a participation to, for us to consider in meeting the goal. What are some of the things you can do as a company to show us your good faith efforts? Number one, designate somebody within your company who will be your MWBE liaison. That'll be the person that will be responsible for trying to make sure that your company is doing everything to meet the MWBE goal, to document everything you're, that's happening on the contract, making sure that they correspond back to us, um, make sure they provide an up-to-date utilization schedule, and everybody knows that a utilization schedule is really just a projection of what we what you believe you're going to spend with those uh, goal credit subs uh, throughout the life of the project in order to get to the goal. So we're looking for you to provide an updated, uh, updated utilization schedule. We're also looking for you to provide prompt responses to the system, meaning we want you to report what you're paying those subs in a timely manner so that we, we know, we can kind of track how you're, how you're meeting the goal as well. The utilization schedule basically tracks your projected spend. The reporting of the payments in the, in, the MW, in the B2G system reports what you're actually spending with the subs. And so that gives us a better way to measure what you're actually paying the subs versus what we're paying you. So we know how you're, how you're performing as far as meeting the goal. Uh, there are some things that we're, we're looking for you to do, some other things we're looking for you to do, like genuinely attempt to resolve disputes with your certified firms. So I'm, I'm not going to tell you how many times I hear we asked for, we, we, we told the certified firm that we need them to start work on tomorrow. They said they can't start until Friday, which is what, two, day, two or three days away. And so we're going to kick them off the contract because they're not ready to, to work uh, they're, they're not ready to start the project when we say they needed to start. Will those two or three days really significantly impact your ability to use that sub? And that's what we're talking about. Genuinely, are you genuinely interested in trying to resolve disputes with your subs? Um, also, if there are disputes with your subs, we try to do mediation between you and the sub to try to resolve the issues, and we look at whether or not you are willing to come in and sit down and talk to us and try to resolve those issues with the subs so that we can move forward and, and make decisions and that don't impact you later on. We also look to see if you actually request a deviation when you add, you know, on your project, you tell us who your goal credit subs are, but you also use other subcontractors on this project uh, because mostly it's not just the MWBs working on the project, you're using other subcontractors. Some of those subcontractors you use on the project, they're actually certified with the city. And so one of the things that we're looking for you and your, your company to do is, if you know you're using other gold credit subs on the project for work other than what you have designated for the MBE subs, tr request a deviation so that you can get credit for the dollars you spend with those certified gold credit subs. And as long as you're not taking work away from the subs that are originally listed, uh, you're fine. That, that, that'll help you in the end to improve upon your percentages. Uh, we're looking for you to promptly respond to, re, to uh, emails, phone calls, questions from us about your MB participation. You know, we're looking at the project, we're looking at it kind of real time in that when we pay you, 
you pay your subs, we're looking at what, the act, what your actual spend is, and so on occasion, we'll actually send you a letter and say, hey, we looked at this contract, had an 18% goal, your company is at 8%, we're looking at your utilization schedule, it says you should probably be about 10% at this point, we want to know what's going on, if this, if this is still a true and accurate reflection, and if you feel you're going to meet the goal by the end of the contract, if not, give us an updated utilization schedule and say, hey, you know, that, that schedule's off, here we are now, here's where, we're, where we think we're going to be. Um, also, promptly respond to any, any inquiries from the city. And it's not just OBO asking you about the gold credit subs because we, you know, we, a couple of years ago, we pushed this challenge to the departments that, you know, this is not just, this is your project and OBO's project. And we both are trying to find answers to the questions about your gold credit and whether or not you're, you, you have a plan to meet the goal. So we're looking for you to respond to, be it OBO, or the department about what's happening with your goal, we're looking for you to, to talk about that. We're looking for you to respond to us. And then one of the other things is to ensure that the goal credit subs that you're using, that they are performing a commercially useful function. We'll talk about, we'll talk about commercial useful function a little more in, in a couple of the slides, but it's really making sure that the subs that you list do the work that you, that you advertise that they will do on the project. Other things you can look at is Provide information that's factually inaccurate and free of material misrepresentation. Tell us the truth. We're here to help you. We're from the government. We're here to help you. So tell us the truth. We'll try to help you. Okay? Attend all meetings and mediation hearings as requested by the city. And then notify us if change orders affect your MBE subs. Uh, part of the whole process is making sure that when you know that something's going to affect your MBE participation, contact OBO, contact your compliance officer, let them provide guidance to you on how to move forward in the, now that you've given us that information. You talk to the department all the time about change orders, you're not talking to OBO about change orders, so just because you're talking to the department about a change order and they're authorizing you to do that, we and OBO may not necessarily know, so let us know that here's a change order that's going to affect our MWBE participation. And if the department is not reaching out to us about that, we'll circle back and get them on the wagon so that they know here's, this, it's going to affect the MB participation and that we're all on the same page as far as that's concerned. Okay. So at the end of the contract, uh, we're going to assess your efforts to meet the MBE goals. Uh, it's always done at the end of the contract. The reason why we do it at the end of the contract is because at that point, the department is telling us there are no more opportunities for MWBE participation on this contract. And so at the end of the contract, that's when we're looking for you to tell us, uh, all, that's, that's when we're looking for you to show us all your efforts. Uh, failure to make good faith efforts uh, at the end of the contract, when you turn in your final documents, Failure to make that could result in an unsatisfactory rating, and an unsatisfactory rating uh, gets reviewed by city council. It could impact your ability to get future contracts because part of not meeting the goal and getting an unsatisfactory rating means that you could possibly be sanctioned. I mean, there's a process to, to uh, appeal it, but that you could possibly be sanctioned, and that sanction may take away your ability to bid on contracts for a time and we don't want you to get into that point if you can, we don't want you to get into that point, so that's why we're trying to explain to you the things you can do with your good faith efforts at the end of the contract to help us avoid that. But unsatisfactory ratings are reviewed by city council and the mayor, and it'll, it definitely can impact your ability to get a future contract. Okay. How do you document all your good faith efforts? They provided great examples up front about, uh, LaTanya and Monica provided great examples up front about documenting your efforts. Uh, so I'm just gonna go through them briefly. Document all the efforts you make to comply with the goal. Anything you do to try to find participation but are unable to, document that. So if you make a phone call to somebody about MBE particip about tr working on your project for MBE participation, you should be documenting that on your, on your uh, phone, on your call log or something. Uh, one of the most sincere forms that we see of that you really want to use those subs that you listed on your contract originally is for you to execute a subcontract agreement with them. 
you that that shows me that you were intending to use that sub to meet the goal. So if one of the things we'll look at, did you execute a subcontract agreement with those subs? Keep a log of all the efforts you make throughout the course. If something happens on the project that uh, takes away your, your sub's ability to work or takes away your ability to use that sub in that instance, document those things because at the end of the contract, you can submit that as part of your efforts and we can review those along with the departments to see if that is in itself one of those things that we need to be uh, looking at as far as your good faith effort. Again, contact OBO for assistance. Each of your projects you have a, an assigned comp compliance officer uh, that's working with you, reviewing those contracts to see if you're making the goal. If at any point in the contract you're having problems meeting the goal, please contact them and let them provide you with guidance on how to make sure you stay compliant with the goals. Uh, when possible, Provide the subcontractors with advance notice. A sub doesn't want to know that they have to start work on Friday uh, if you know, you have, they haven't heard from you in four months. They, you need to tell them when, they, when you expect them to start so that they have a way to plan their schedules and to plan their staff so that they can support you on your goal efforts. So it's just, <coughs> excuse me, it's just like providing them additional notice providing them with notice that you're going to need them at a certain point. Okay. Okay. Common observations we see from my, my compliance office, common ob observations we see as it relates to your good faith effort or failure to uh, provide the good faith efforts. We see nobody responds to our letters. We send you letters and we say what's happening with your goal, we don't get a response back. <clears throat> we make phone calls, <coughs> we don't get phone calls back. But that's, that's all documentation of your sincere effort to meet the goal when you respond back to us. You don't execute a subcontract agreement with these subs. You list MBEs for gold credit without notifying the subcontractor. We still see that today where you actually have a company that you list on your gold credit sub list as a gold credit sub, and we, one of the things that we do, we actually send a letter to those gold credit subs that say, you're, you're, this prime says they contacted you and they want to use you on this contract. We get calls all the time. Never heard of that company. Could be they're talking to your estimator, but a lot of times they said, we never heard, we never had any discussion with that company about working on this contract. And so we also have failure to submit deviation requests. You use subs all the time on your project, gold credit subs, subs that can actually, that are actually certified with the city as an MW or SBE. You never ask for gold credit. You never do a deviation to say, hey, I'm using this sub. I want their dollars to count toward my goal. That helps you. And then one of the other things is you fail to report the payment. You don't report your payments made to your MBE subs or to any of your subs. And so, at the, end of the, at the end of the project, when we're trying to close the project, we don't see any payments. We're saying, you got goose eggs for MBE participation. And you know it's better, but we don't know. And, and that's one of those things that we see that you need to work on. You self-perform work. But we actually see, we actually see primes that are actually self-performing work that's designated for your subs. So when you turn in your, your bids, you actually tell us the subs that you're going to be using for gold credit. You identify to us the work that they're going to be performing. We expect that those subs are going to be the only one that perform that work. And if, there, and if something happens where you end up having to perform those work, that work, you need to be talking to Obo about what's, why you're doing that and what's happening so that we can provide you with guidance to help you stay compliant. And then fail you to understand the, how the MBEs perf will perform on the contract. So you actually tell us on your on your 600 documents you actually tell us that this company is going to perform this company is going to provide pipe or trucking or concrete and you tell us that they you know you tell us the the companies that are going to provide those services we're looking for those companies to provide those services what what normally happens is and we'll talk about this in the, uh, we'll talk about this is your subcontractors that you're bringing to our projects bring it to our projects, 
your subcontractors are using other subcontractors. Those subcontractors may not be certified, okay? So when your subcontractors use other non-certified subcontractors, we can't give you credit for those dollars that your subcontractors <laughs> sub out to a firm that is not certified. I know you had the original agreement with the sub to say, we want you to provide concrete or pipe or trucking, and you probably didn't know that your subcontractor was actually going to bring some other people to help them on the contract, but that's your responsibility. We ask you to push those same requirements down to your subs that we tell you. We tell you that we want to know everybody that works on our project, okay? So if you bring somebody to our project, we're asking you, we tell you in the pre-construction meeting, let us know who they are because we want to check them out to make sure that they are not debarred, to make sure that, <clears throat> that we have all their information so that we can track and make sure that when we pay you, you pay them. So anything that we're asking you to do, we're asking you have to, you have to make sure you include that information in your subcontract agreements for your subs that if they're going to bring anybody else to your project, that they're going to also include that same language and notify us in advance, just like you would. So we see a lot of you, we see a lot of primes failing to know how their subs will actually perform and not understanding the impact of their MBE gold credit subs subcontracting to non-MBE gold credit subs. And then failure to notify us uh, promptly of any changes that will affect your utilization. So when you find out, <clears throat> we're expecting you to tell us so that we can provide you with guidance on how to stay compliant uh, under those terms, okay? Okay, commercial useful function. Now, I, I guess about three or four months ago, we actually went back and revisited the commercial useful function uh, process to look at it to make sure that Commercially useful function basically is where your subs perform as, as they say they're going to perform. And, and I'll give you some examples. Like if you have a trucking company that you're bringing to our project, that trucking company is providing trucks to our project, their own trucks, uh, and not basically subbing all the work out to a, another trucking firm or using more owner operators than they're using their own trucks. Uh, with trucking, we actually started this process. We actually uh, kind of adopted the same process that the feds use on trucking, where for every one truck that your certified sub brings to the project, we allow them to use one owner-operator truck. And that is a truck that, that is a, 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 a person who owns and drives their truck. They show up on, the, on your subcontractor's payroll and that's the only truck they're, they're driving and operating the truck that they bring to their project. And so that, that affects you. If you have a company that has six trucks and you need 60 trucks for this project, and they can only bring you six trucks a day, and you're, you're, you need 12, 14 trucks a day, you're probably not gonna get full credit for that trucking firm because they're, in order to meet your needs, they're probably going to have to bring in another trucking firm or more owner operators than what's allowable in order for them to get full credit for their work. Okay. Uh, also, under the commercial useful function, <clears throat> all of our certified firms are certified in certain areas. So, and I, I use this example, if you are a hot dog vendor and you're on our construction contract, uh, if we don't have opportunities for hot dog vendors on that construction contract, you're probably not going to be able to get credit for their work. Now, you, the, the hot dog vendor is certified with the city, so what if, they, what if you say they're going to do our concrete for us? Well, where are they going to get the concrete from? So we're going to kind of trace back to where all, where the, where, trace the origin back. That, con, that hot dog vendor isn't certified with the city to provide concrete, and so even though they're certified, they're not certified in that area, you're not going to get credit towards your goal. So you need to be aware of how your subs perform on our projects as far as the goal is concerned, as far as goal credit. Prime contractors only get credit when the MBE performs a commercial useful function. 
And again, please let's not confuse the fact that they are certified with a commercial useful function. Again, certified means that we have certified them with the city and they've been designated as a minority woman, small or disadvantaged business enterprise. It doesn't mean that they've been certified in a certain area. And that, so we're looking more commercially useful function. We're looking more at are they certified in the areas that you plan on using them to meet the goal? Okay. So, so, so we'll talk about some of those things that some of those challenges that we, we know you're going to see coming going forward about the about subs that you're using on our project. Uh, commercial useful function and goal credit. A subcontractor, because a subcontractor performs specific work. Uh, with their own forces, subcontractors can actually have, subcontractors can actually use non-certified firms to provide them with material, but as long as they install the material, then, they're, then they would get full credit, okay? So subcontractors are a, a different breed, but again, we also have to watch how they perform to make sure they do the work that they're listed, and if they're bringing materials from a non-MBE, that they're actually installing that material. So now let's talk about the suppliers. Here's where we're going to have our, here's where we're going to have our biggest opportunity uh, as far as meeting the goal and making sure you're compliant. And we want to work with you to make sure this is happening. Suppliers, suppliers are there are like seven distinct functions that suppliers must do in order to get credit on your contract. And so I think we've got them listed. I don't know if I can count right. A through G is seven or eight, not sure. But number one, they must negotiate price, okay? So do your suppliers negotiate price on your contracts? Number two, they must determine the quality and quantity. So we're looking for, do your suppliers determine quality and quantity? Uh, C, order the materials. D, show, the, show that the invoice is in the certified firm's name. Uh, e, pay for the material itself, control delivery, and be certified to provide supplies. We, what we're seeing, we've been doing, I, I think we have really ramped up the amount of commercial useful function audits we have been performing on your gold credit subcontractors. We're not seeing a lot of this, and so we're sending you letters. When we find out, we're sending you letters saying, hey, we looked at this company, we believe that you're not going to get full credit for the dollars you spend with them towards your goal. And we're telling you this because we're looking at those A through G items and saying we're, we're, we're finding evidence that says they are not providing, uh, they are not uh, behaving in those manners. Okay? Uh, and then we talked about truckers earlier. Again, truckers is basically a one-to-one -one ratio. A trucker can, can come to the project and then they have owner operator. They can use one owner operator for every truck that they own, that they employ somebody to bring to the project. And so those things are, those, those things will affect your MBE or gold credit uh, on the projects. So now we've told you all this stuff about the goal and, and the gold credit and we're trying to evaluate your gold credit. And now we want to talk about now that at the end of the project, when there is no more opportunity for MBE participation, our office is tasked with evaluating w whether or not you met the goal, uh, either through getting us the number we're looking for or your good faith efforts. The compliance officers that are assigned to your project are actually gathering all that documentation and they're putting, it, putting, it, putting it together a recommendation that, that we're going to be giving, that we would actually give to they would actually give to myself and the assistant director to say, we believe their good faith efforts were sufficient, or we believe that their efforts, that, that they were unsatisfactory. And then we will actually send a letter to you saying that based on our evaluation, your rating is this. And then we'll give you 14 days to respond. If, and if we don't hear back from you in 14 days, we assume you agree with us. But if there's some other information that you feel we do not have, that's your chance to turn it in to us, to say, hey, here's some other factors that you need to consider, so that before you make that decision, here's some other factors you need to consider. You can turn that information in. You know, uh, Latanya and Monica talked about providing that information, your good faith efforts documentation with your uh, bid. 
Well, when we tell, when we, when we send you your, uh, when we send you this letter saying that we've, we've evaluated your efforts, if we haven't received your good faith efforts by that point, we're assuming that because we tell you at the pre-construction meeting that, hey, gather all your good faith efforts and when no opportunity exists or when the contract ends, submit that to us so that we can evaluate that before we make that decision. We would rather you send your good faith efforts in to us before we make that decision, but if we don't have them, we will make that evaluation, we will make that decision. We will send you a letter, certified mail, saying here's how we believe your company is evaluated on this project. We will give you 14 days if you haven't provided us with your good faith efforts documentation at that point. That's the perfect chance for you to try to get that back to us within that time period so that we can look at it again and if look at it for the first time if you haven't given it to us previously and that way we can evaluate it and if your efforts are sufficient we're going to be able to give you a satisfactory rating but you you have to look at all the components that we gave you okay okay with that i will turn it back over to the assistant director thank you so much team okay i do i do think it's really important i just i just want to emphasize this one more time that morris mentioned regarding um commercial use of function because that significantly affects the credit that we can give you for your your subs performance certification alone does not equal 100 percent credit we're looking at how that individual certified firm performs on that particular project. And just because a, a certified firm performed in a particular way on one project, we're not assuming that they're going to perform in the same one every project. So that is what assessing commercial useful function involves. Are they certified in the NICS code in which they're actually performing? And in order to receive 100% credit, are they actually performing in the way that was described on this slide as far as suppliers were concerned? If suppliers are not going to meet, are not meeting those seven requirements, for 100% credit to the prime, we're actually likely going to just assess a broker's fee in that situation if they're not meeting those seven requirements. Um, so I know the goal for contractors is 100% credit for each and every certified firm that's participating on your project. So it's really important to pay attention to exactly how these firms are actually performing. And so that's the last piece.